On today's episode, SpaceX is about to do something crazy with Starship. There's a new space station on its way to NASA, and Space Force is yet again sounding the alarm about China. This week, SpaceX finally stepped back into action with their Starship rocket by testing a super heavy booster for flight number 9. But this is not a new booster. You've seen this one before. Think back to Starship Flight 7 in January 2025, the second ever return to launch site and Mechazilla Tower Catch. That was Super Heavy Booster number 14, and it's the same rocket that is currently being prepped for flight. If we remember even further back to October 2024 and the first booster catch, that rocket was not in good shape by the time it came to a rest, thoroughly on fire. This one was retired to the Starbase Rocket Garden. But by the second time around, we saw much less of that drama taking place. The booster appeared to perform flawlessly and returned a little charred but otherwise functional. Now SpaceX does have two other super heavy boosters in their arsenal right now. One is Booster 16, freshly built and never flown. The other is Booster 15, successfully recovered from flight number 8. Although we did see a couple of engine relight malfunctions on that launch. So it looks like SpaceX is going in the direction of high risk, high reward. There's no way to know for sure if the current iteration of Super Heavy can withstand the pressures of launching twice. We have to just send it and then see what happens. That's the risk. But if it works, then SpaceX has proven reusability of the most powerful rocket booster ever made. That's a big reward. This is fundamental to the entire Starship mission. If you can't reuse the booster, then nothing else makes sense. In the long term, Starship will require rapid reuse of the booster stage. But for now, we've seen a three-month turnaround time from catch to static fire. That's still pretty good. The average refurbishment time for a Falcon 9 booster is about one month. And from what we've seen right now, it looks like SpaceX had to replace four of the Super Heavy's 33 Raptor engines. It's not clear what other work was done for the refurbishment. One thing that's still uncertain is just how much stress SpaceX is willing to put on a reused booster at this point. There's speculation abound that it will not go through with a second tower catch attempt, and instead SpaceX will use Booster 14 to test aerodynamic stress before splashing down in the water. Now all that it needs is a ship, and oddly enough, this is the half of the rocket that we're most concerned about right now. We saw SpaceX begin building Ship 35 early this year, and on March 11th it was successfully cryo-tested for the first time to prove its structural integrity. That means that as soon as it's received all six engines, it can return to the test site for its own static fire. We have no doubt that Ship 35 can perform a hot fire test. The question is what happens when it gets to space. We've seen two iterations of the Starship V2 fly this year, and both of them experienced catastrophic failures at the exact same point in their mission, just shortly before the second engine cutoff. We know that both of these failures were caused by excessive vibration inside the ship that rattled the fuel lines to the point of breakage, which then became leakage, which became fire, and then explosion. SpaceX has not specified what they've done differently with this new ship to try and prevent that from happening. As for when we might see the next launch, if you follow Elon's timeline of four to six weeks after Flight 8, then we should be about two weeks away. And that might still be the case. But again, given the before-mentioned circumstances, we're expecting to see a pretty extensive testing campaign of the new ship before anything can move forward. So let's see how that plays out before we even start thinking about launch. So here's the deal. Between researching rocket launches, writing these scripts, and dodging the endless chaos of life on Earth, I need a solid pair of earbuds. Not the kind that costs as much as a Falcon 9 payload, and ones that don't die halfway through a podcast. And that's why I use Raycon's everyday earbuds. First off, active noise cancellation is no joke. I can finally drown out the guy on Zoom who still hasn't found a mute button, or the neighbors who think Saturday morning is leaf blower o'clock. Battery? 32 hours, that's almost enough to get you through a Mars transfer orbit. And if you forget to charge them, 10 minutes plugged in equals 90 minutes of listening. Crisis averted. They also connect to two devices at once, which means no more fumbling through Bluetooth settings like it's a NASA control panel. Just switch from laptop to phone seamlessly. 
And yeah, they are actually comfortable. No ear aches, no falling out, no awkward adjusting mid-video call. I've got the forest green ones paired with their concrete protective case. They are sleek, tough, and a fraction of the price of other top brands. Bottom line, Raycons sound great, stay in, don't break the bank, and they just work, which in this economy feels like a miracle. So go to buyraycon.com slash the space race and get 20% off site wide. But there is another exciting SpaceX launch that seems to be approaching quickly, and this will involve Falcon 9 launching its first ever space station. Actually, it will be the first time any SpaceX rocket has launched a space station to orbit. The company behind the station, known as Vast Space, has already signed this contract with SpaceX to launch their Haven 1 space station in the first half of next year. Now, in the world of spaceflight, schedules are great to have, but they hardly ever predict reality. And that goes for everyone involved, not just SpaceX. But Vast has presented a new testing schedule for Haven 1 that appears to reinforce their 2026 launch date, because Vast won't be testing their space station alone. They're going to NASA for this one. The company has been working on its current station design since 2023, using the first iteration as a small-scale testing platform which will later double as a home for astronauts during short scientific stays in Earth orbit. The primary goal of Haven 1 is to test and prepare for their next large project, known as Haven 2, which will be competing for a NASA contract to replace the ISS, one of many commercial stations that NASA hopes to use as a replacement for their current orbital laboratory. The design of Haven 1 is a simple, single-module station that relies on the SpaceX Dragon capsule to reinforce its power, propulsion, and life support systems. It's kind of like a space camper attachment for the Dragon. In contrast, Haven 2 will use multiple smaller modules to construct a larger station that is fully self-sufficient, which would make it a truly flexible solution for NASA and any other industry that wants to operate in space. But before all that, VAST needs Haven 1, as the young company lacks any real experience with building space stations and can't afford to mess it up on Haven 2 when its goal is to meet the strict requirements set forth by NASA. And while they have been getting closer to their first finished product, VAST did have to push the expected launch date from this year into next after mock-up testing results indicated a longer build time than they had hoped for. Finally, however, they're back on track in building the first full flight-ready station. After that's finished, they'll need to test the vehicle to make sure it can withstand the high-temperature, high-vibration launch and operation environments. To accomplish this, VAST is headed to the Neil Armstrong Test Center in Ohio. The company recently struck a deal with NASA to bring their module to the same testing ground that has previously hosted the Orion capsule and the Sierra Space Dream Chaser. This highly valuable testing is planned to take place in early 2026, which should remain in line with their previously stated launch date goal for the middle of next year, assuming everything goes as planned. There are many companies competing for a space station contract under NASA, but it's looking like VAST might actually be one of the most promising, as they're the first to reach true mock-up testing and bring a flight-ready prototype to NASA. The American space program desperately needs a replacement for the ISS, not only for science, but perhaps more importantly, to avoid letting China have the only orbital space station. This has become even more important in recent years and months, as relationships between the countries have become incredibly tense, with active trade wars and closely competitive militaries. This standoff is especially apparent when you look at the two nations' space programs. The Chinese military has been actively competing with the United States Space Force for dominance in Earth orbit. This has become such a problem that a hearing was held by the United States-China Economic and Security Review Commission to discuss potential threats from the Chinese government and their potential solutions. The council that came together to discuss the issue was formed by the United States government, specifically to analyze Chinese-U.S. relationships, and is mostly made up of appointed commissioners and not actual lawmakers. Space Force General Chance Saltzman had the opportunity to address the council, and the results may have strained relationships even further. 
Saltzman addressed the current political standoff and warned against the Council simply seeing the conflict in space as yet another space race in which only technological and scientific advancements are on the line. Instead, he says that this is much more serious, as he stated that Beijing's space ambitions constitute a powerful destabilizing force. His concerns were mostly centered around China's large arsenal of anti-space weapons, which can take down satellites from the ground using lasers, missiles, or digital attacks. His concerns have been shared by many individuals, including Space Force General Stephen Whitting, who has also spoken out about the issue. The orbital face-off has even been covered by the mainstream media, which has started to spread a sense of fear among some Americans. But the general insisted that caution is warranted in this situation, but the public has nothing to be scared of at this time. He explained that the U.S. still has the greatest orbital capabilities of any country, and China is still far behind. In addition, China's capabilities only seem larger because they are concentrated around the Western Pacific region, which contrasts with the United States and their worldwide capabilities. However, the threat of orbital conflict still exists, which is why Saltzman is pushing for a change to space policy that has existed for so long. Policies and precautions such as the process to enroll in the Space Force dramatically slow getting anything into orbit and that makes it harder to train personnel. He wants to get rid of these policies or at least make the changes in order to speed up both preparatory missions as well as quick response missions. It seems that things are heating up in space between the US and China. And while peace is what everyone hopes for, we also have to be ready for anything. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash the space race. Click the link in the description and treat yourself to earbuds that don't suck.